Okay. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to the first breakfast of 2018. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, everybody who helped this morning uh, for setting up breakfast upstairs here, and especially for those individuals who set up downstairs for Super Sunday. So for all those gentlemen who participated in one of those two, please stand and take your recognition, which you really deserve. I notice it becomes difficult when we're doing two things at once, but we've always been successful, and this is just another time. Uh, there are some new members and guests here, so I'd like for them to uh, rise, and we'll start out with uh, uh, Bernie Schuster. Why don't you give us a little, uh, a minute presentation of yourself? <laughs> Bernie Schuster, who doesn't want to give any presentation? Okay, where are you from, Bernie? Cherry Hill, around the corner. Okay, uh, very good. <laughs> okay. Cherry Hill Residence. Very good. Do you give discounts on cars? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I know we have more. Right here. Mr. Yeah. Sachs, number two. Yeah, I'm Phil Sachs. I, I try not to bring it up, but I'm his brother. Oh, okay. Uh, my name's Alan Haber. Uh, I'm from Bronx Boy. Uh, currently living in Cherryville. Currently working. I'm uh, in the hospital sales division of Landmark. All right, thank you. Uh, are there any other guests here of new members? Oh, I'm sorry. We have a guest here. Oh, okay. Uh, down here about a year and a couple of months. And now he's tired of picture sales. Okay. Well, welcome back. That's another joke. Yeah, well, thank you. All right. And we have another guest here. Ethan Bottles. Just who you are, what you do. Uh, I was uh, a teacher in Camden for many years. I'm in the mortgage business now. Wow. Thank you. I also uh, volunteered my time here on uh, Mondays for a special needs basketball program. Here Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Welcome. Anybody else? Nope. Okay. Uh, just a quickie uh, for those members who haven't uh, made their dues payments yet. You have the opportunity to do so today. Uh, uh, for table captains, uh, the sheet is slightly different. There's a column so that uh, if you want to pay your dues, the table captain will make a, a check mark in that column. Uh, and by the way, please print legibly so I can somehow transpose that. Sometimes it is a major challenge. Okay. Uh, why don't we uh, do a mozi and start in tags. guys go up there to Yeah, that's true. Dick, we can do that afterwards. Okay. Uh, for those for those people for those people who have uh, uh, need assistance, uh, please take your uh, opportunity to get up there first, as well as our guests and our uh, new members, and, and then we'll make the mozi because every time you guys, I don't know, you can break a track record. Okay, uh, now you get your opportunity if you would like to make a mozi. All right. <laughs> Thank you. George. Dick, come over here and make presentations of Bernie Schuster. Stand up. Yeah. Hey, come on over. And that's all we know about him. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, Bernie Sanders. Do something for months, right? Arnold Sanders? Bernie, Bernie, not Arnold. Bob Levin? Come on up. Oh, there you are. Okay. Where are you, Mark? Don would like to make a little presentation, our sports enthusiast. We did just conclude our, I think it was our fifth year of fantasy football. And uh, 
it was a very exciting season and, and, and you know the players that we had there were 287 players not available because of concussions this year highest ever in the NFL so we had a lot of transactions that took place but uh, just to give you an idea uh, as far as the winners are concerned Ed Stein where's that to third place Gerson Sigmund, uh, Gerson's not here. Gerson's uh, ill. He's ill? He's been ill for yeah. a few weeks, if anybody knows me. I, I know. All right, because I know he still hasn't cashed his winnings, but Gerson took second, and Stan Schumas and yours truly took first. But even the team that had the worst record, 12th place, still won $15. You want to know who that is? The Big Chill, Mel Chilowicz and Dick Knopf came in, but I want to say it was a solid 12th place. We are looking, if you're interested, we're already planning for next year. If we get enough interest, we need about three or four more teams. I would start two divisions, and one would be called the Orthodox Division, and one will be called the Reform Division, and we'll have our own Super Bowl that we'll call the Kiddish Cup. But there'll be two distinctly separate leagues, but we will have the final pool for the, for the Super Bowl, and that'll be a different pot of money. So, if you're interested at some point, just let me know. Either send me an email, see me at the end of the meeting. Uh, because once we get the number of teams, we really would have to have uh, eight teams minimum in each league. If you're uncomfortable having a league, a, t a team of your own, partner up with somebody. You, you, we could have four owners per team, and then you could split the cost. It, to get in is $125. That's it for the whole season. And you, each week that you win, you get five dollars back. Transaction money. I'm sorry. Transaction money. There is no transaction money. It's 125. And that's it. So again, if you're interested, let us know. Um, the other thing I wanted to get your input on is: Would you be interested in having a Super Bowl? pool next year where you sign up for the boxes and based on the score of each quarter can I just get a show of hands how many people would be okay we might you know we we might be able to do that then I'll probably start that in November believe it or not so that we have several weeks to or several beatings to fill all the boxes but it's worth giving that a try Okay. Any questions? Okay, Marty, thank you. Thank you, Don. I, Len, uh, would like a couple of moments? Not even a couple of moments. This is just a personal request. Uh, I just bought on Amazon an album, uh, 33 and a third, of something called Rosian Kids Mandolin. I don't even have a turntable, but this is the best album ever made on Yiddish radios and things like that. Does anyone have any access or know where I can go to have these two albums burned onto CDs? That's all I want to know. Yes? Yeah, that's uh, over here uh, at the corner of Race and Rest. Bra what? It's called Best Photo. Best Photo. Nice guy Thank you very much. All right, Nelson? Well, oh, there you are. Thank you, Marty. Yeah, last month, I made a presentation on the military and veterans affairs. At the end of my presentation, I talked about the $3,000 exemption from the state on your income tax. Okay, as a result of the Jewish war veterans getting together with the American Legion and veterans of foreign wars, we went to your senators, assembly people. They have now agreed, if you're, who's a veteran in the room? Every veteran with an honorable, honorable discharge Submit the forms that I was talking about last time for the $3,000 exemption with your honorable discharge form. It doesn't matter what form it is. It doesn't have to be a DD-214 or whatever. So long as it says honorable discharge, you're going to get that exemption. 
and so on your income tax forms, but you have to submit it ahead of time so they can process, process you through the paperwork at the Treasury Department. So again, 3000 bucks as an exemption. Okay. Yes? Wow. Did you mention something about the, the county metals that we can give out? Oh, I forgot about that. Uh, we are planning on having a metals presentation for those people that were in or that are veterans who are in the military now, in this organization. Uh, the county has about three different types of medals. If you were in the Vietnam era, peacetime, if you uh, were in Korea, there's some others also, World War II, but we don't have anybody for that. And we're going to have a presentation as part of one of our meetings sometime in the future. We haven't really planned that. Uh, but I'm going to ask, uh, not now, but it, we'll send out an email asking people to, that, to register that, have, that are veterans that served during these periods of time, and we'll arrange for that. And we're going to invite your family to it also, because it is an exciting presentation. Yes? i got a question. I received the information on that $3,000 uh, exemption. Exemption. exemption, but from my reading of the information, you had to be discharged this year, the year of 2017, they couldn't go back before that. That's not correct. If, That's if, the information I got from the VA. Don't believe, believe me. Believe and I'll give you my card. That Anybody wrong. that's a veteran that has gotten, gotten an honorable discharge, anytime, you're eligible for it now. No, the, the, no, what happened is they misstated it. They didn't come to the Governor's Veteran Services Council to put that form together. It went through the Treasury. It's put into effect the law in 2017, which means you put it on your income tax for 2017 forward. You only have to file one time. It's for ever, all veterans. And again, I was in this conference, JWV was the head of it actually, Jewish War Veterans. It's confirmed by the Deputy Commissioner for Veterans Affairs. Please. That question's still open. I don't think it does, frankly. It's to the veterans. By the way, the spouse has to sign the form because in New Jersey, it's uh, the law says you have to do it. So you have to get your spouse to sign the form. Don't forge your signature or his. Please. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be notified. I already said that I actually faxed it. I didn't know anybody had faxed it. But um, yeah. I faxed it in. Were they going to notify us that they received it, or are we going to just take a buy at it while they wow. guess that they got it? <laughs> That was part of the discussion also. You're supposed to get a notification. What happened is the young lady in Trenton in the Treasury Department didn't know what she was doing until last week. So isn't that normal? Let's talk the art about that. It's normal. So somebody sat down with her and said, you're supposed to notify these people. You'll get a notification, they're saying, within 90 days okay. that it's been received and processed. Okay. Now, for those of you that have the exemption of $250 on your real estate tax also, so they're going to match these databases to make sure that those people that did not file get, still get it. But do you believe Treasury is actually going to do that? No. I don't believe them. So file the forms. Don't believe that story. They're going to match it because they don't know how to match anything in Trenton. And I, I hate to be negative, but that's the way it looks. I, I'm I took too much time from Marty. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you all. One last question. Yeah, please. I'm oh, sorry. 125 or 250. I just got the bill that said it's 250 a year and they split it up into six months, 125 each. By the way, there is a bill going through the Senate right now, which I think will be approved to get that increase to five hundred dollars or a thousand. We're trying to get the assembly to agree to a thousand, and then we'll get a thousand for you off. Five hundred for six months, five hundred for six months. So we're gradually again, if anybody's not a member of the Jewish War of Veterans, remember we're there working for you. Join and talk to me if you want to join. Please. Are they going to also change the criteria for the uh, local <coughs> real estate tax to the criteria of used for this uh, 3,000 exemption? That has to be a constitutional amendment in the state of New Jersey, but we're working on that. That's one of the list of 10 top things we're doing, and we came up with this list a few days ago. A good point, and the definition of a veteran will match the federal government after we change the Constitution. So when you, whenever there's an election, probably around November, you're going to see a little block saying we're changing this to that, and you've got to vote on it. Isn't that stupid to make it a constitutional amendment? But that's what they did years ago, so we have to change it as a constitutional amendment. I'm sorry, Barney. No, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Again, thank you all. All right. Uh, in, in, in March, uh, we're going to have the law enforcement breakfast, and so I would like Mike, who's spare, uh, heading the thing, to give a little bit of a mini presentation as well as an invitation. Thank you.
Thanks, Marty. March 20th, we have the law enforcement breakfast. We've been doing it since 1996. Typically, there's a couple hundred of law enforcement officials and senior management, federal, state, local, everything. Everything from police chief associations from Burlington, Camden, Gloucester, and Salem counties to the FBI and the uh, U.S. Marshal Service and the state police and on and on, and we honor them and they pick awards. And for that time, we needed to have quite a few volunteers to help out. And uh, if you think you can get there in the morning early, I know we have a month and a half or so yet, um, Bob Greenberg would be the person to see. Bob, would you stand please? And Bob's in charge of everything with the room and things typically need moving around. Even earlier, thanks Bob, even earlier we, we need uh, people to help in the kitchen and that's Rich Moskowitz, and if you're able to do that, we really need your help. Tell them what time. <laughs> no, go ahead, fellas. In the kitchen, um, we really have to have people ready for these guys because uh, they have guns. <laughs> I'd like everyone, if you can get there by 6, 6.30, closer to 6 than 6.30, because we have to cook the eggs and then bop, 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 bop. So where, get where? everything together. Where? Just Just the Oh, and it's on a Tuesday, not a Sunday. It's on a Tuesday. Tuesday, March 20th. Tuesday, March um, 20th. Okay, so around 6 o'clock if you can make it, please. So next month we'll send out a handout sheet. So I can yep. And Bob, okay. you have different yeah, needs? We want, we want all volunteers to try to get here as close to 6 o'clock as possible. That way we can divide people up and we have the manpower uh, allocated. For those who show up after 7.30 in the morning, just to let you know, so that there's no questions about it. Because we'll have that room pretty well set up and the food will be pretty well made because they're gonna start eating at 8.30. So if you're there before 7.30, you don't pay. You get there after 7.30, you pay like everybody else, okay? And what would that be? What? What would the fee be? What you pay for breakfast. Oh, here. Yeah, uh, what, I think what we were doing was the, vo the volunteers don't pay. Okay, and if you come after 7:30, then it's the ten dollars. Is it ten? Ten. Okay. Ten dollars for the breakfast. So it kind of pays to come early, doesn't it? Now, on everybody's table, on every table, there's two of these, and these are not the finished product but it gives you a good idea of the sponsors and who they are. The only other thing is we may be getting the Camden County Sheriff to be a, sh to be a sponsor and we'll have to redo this whole thing. But that's, that's a good problem to have. We have a 50-50 and the benef it benefits the Hero Scholarship Fund for Camden County and it also benefits the Holocaust Education Center and Museum downstairs. And we've distributed thousands of dollars, thousands. Uh, Ed Stein, where are you? What did we do last year? The, the last time we did it for them, 2016? $1,000 split between the two charities. Okay, and one before that, roughly the same? So we do rather well on the 50-50s, on the and we do it a little differently. I think it's 5 and $10, and these guys just keep buying them and buying them. So it, if you haven't been to one, you'll find it to be an extraordinary type of program because we can't introduce dignitaries that we'd be there forever. Almost every damn guy in the room is a police chief or better. Okay, thank you very much. Bob? Just one more thing, guys. When the police show up, they're going to be in their dress blues. Please respect that. Show up in nothing less than business casual. Okay? No sweatshirts. All right? Uh, you know, we're you know a decent looking outfit, business casual. Okay? Shirts? Um, not really. I, I don't think that that's really necessary. But um, I know I'll probably wear a sports jacket. And, uh, that type of thing. But these guys are going to show up in their dress blue. All right, they take this seriously. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right. Just want to let you know that it could be, if you come to help out, it could be as simple as setting up a table with napkins and cutlery and cups, etc. It's not anything major. Uh, obviously, we'd like you to help with getting the food uh, prepared, but minor things we'll also do. And the food includes a hot meal also, if you want that. You know, things like French toast and blintzes. So it's something slightly different than this. Obviously, we'll have the bagels and locks also.
Okay, uh, Rich Moskowitz, Yoma Shoah. So I just want to, uh, again, uh, if you can get there by 6 o'clock, um, the more help the better. And uh, of course, uh, Rich Dutkin usually helps out in the kitchen and won't be showing up this year. So uh, we all send our best to Rich. And anyone seen Rich lately in the last? How's he, Mike, how's he doing? Lenny? Lenny? Doing better? Okay. All right, good. So Rich was always uh, the, uh, the heart of the kitchen help, so uh, we, we got to fill in for him. Um, another date to put on your calendars is Wednesday, April 11th. That's when the um, Yamashoa Holocaust observance will be for the community. Um, the South Jersey Men's Club has always helped out um, with the observance, and the main, main deal is giving out the yellow Yorkshire candles. I was going to bring one, but I forgot to. Um, we give out the candles for free and we accept donations and all the donations go to the Holocaust Museum and the Goodwin Education Center. Um, we collect donations that night but we also have, our men's club has always uh, graciously donated money towards the uh, yellow candles. The candles are $72 a case and we will take uh, donations for a whole case, half case, quarter case or whatever you want to give. Um, you can send the money to me or to Phil. And uh, but again, it'll be Wednesday, April 11th, and it's going to be at TBS, Temple Beth Shalom, this year. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Rich. The last item before we get into our uh, speaker, uh, there are long sleeve shirts available for anybody who wants to purchase them. Uh, they're $25 a piece. I have a couple. Oh, you want? Okay. Uh, and I'm the model, so here it is. Looks beautiful. On me? Sure. Yeah, yeah j just to clar clarify, um, the long sleeve shirts are $25. If you're a new member, of course, you get a short sleeve included with your dues. But anybody who wants the long sleeves, $25. A um, couple, couple things. Um, we, if most of you members have been around within a year or so, um, we just have a janitor who helped us set up here every week. His name was Tom Scrott. Um, he died probably six or eight months ago. Um, he used to be, have everything all set up for us. He used to join us for bagel and locks usually uh, and enjoyed uh, helping us. And um, the club uh, donated $500 to the food bank, um, the uh, JFCS food bank, uh, in his uh, memory. We got a nice note back from his family, and I'll just read it to you. It's very short. Um, thank you so much for remembering my brother Tom by your donation to the food bank. It was very thoughtful of all of you. Tom had mentioned your meetings to me and the food that was served. I suppose he looked forward to your meetings. I, I have enclosed a remembrance card uh, concerning Tom. Thank you, Bob and Marlene Scrott. Um, so that was very nice of them to uh, acknowledge that contribution. Um, I, I wanted to mention something else that I got a big kick out of recently. Um, a few of us here, I know Dave Schwartz, there's probably a few others, I don't know them all. Um, we participate in a program called Take the Wheel. Uh, it started three, four, five years ago, uh, transporting veterans to doctor's appointments. Uh, and then it, uh, it actually grew into taking people like from the uh, Jewish senior living communities, Saltzman House and uh, Gesher and so forth, and, and from their homes to uh, doctor's appointments. Um, about three weeks ago, I picked up a gentleman in Barrington. Um, he was 92 years old. He was a World War II vet. He served three months at the end of the war in the Pacific. And I thought that was pretty neat, and he was sharp as a tack, and still pretty mobile. Um, I took him over to Lourdes at uh, the old Ellisburg Circle uh, location that they have, and we were sitting there just finishing up, and the gentleman walked over to me and he said, uh, he, uh, uh, the guy that I transported was wearing his World War II hat. Um, and a gentleman came over, a younger guy my age, younger, <laughs> younger than 92, <laughs> came, came over and said, um, could you wait a minute, I want to bring my father over uh, and introduce him to your father. And I said, well, it's not my father, but that's fine, 
bring him over. And he brought his father over, and his father was 95, and served in the Pacific for three years as a uh, P-24 gunner. So that was pretty neat. I, I, I actually have a photo of him if you want to see it. it they, the two of them talked for a few minutes. And, and the other guy was sharp as a tack, too. <laughs> I mean, they were both very lucid. You know, I hope we're, I hope we're all in that uh, condition when we get to be in our 90s. Too late. Too late? <laughs> I, I just have a real quick one I want to read you. And if you've heard one of these before, just wait till I'm finished. It'll only take a minute. Uh, this came from a, a friend of mine has two tickets for the 2018 Super Bowl in Minneapolis. Both are box seats and in a great location. He's an avid Eagles fan. He paid about 8500 each for the tickets, but he didn't realize when he bought them that it was going to be the same day as his wedding. If you are, if you are interested, he's looking for someone to take his place. It's at St. Paul's Church. It's, it's at St. Paul's Church in, in Waco, Texas at 3 p.m. Her name is Ashley. She, she's 5'4", about 115 pounds, and I'm told she's a very good cook. She'll be the one in the white dress. Everybody got that email. Thank you. All right, one, one last quick item. Deck. Marty, I'd like to just tell everybody we have additional uh, membership applications. If you know of anyone that's interested in joining, by all means, bring them to our next meeting in February. Does anybody need an application by any chance? This is it. Kind of is our application slash brochure because it tells us tells people it gives them a basic idea of what we're all about. So if you do see me after the meeting or now, not now. What? Wait till after the meeting. All right, Dave Schwartz. I picked up a couple last week. Uh, he's the veteran for a doctor's appointment. First time I had met them, and the first time I've driven a couple together. I put her in the back seat, him in the front seat, and I said, only one of you gives me directions how to get to the doctor. He said, turn right, she said, turn left. Anyway, nothing there. That's right. Before I introduce Mel, I want to tell you that next month our meeting here will be, uh, topic will be, forgive me, Cooper Health Systems has given us a urologist, a doctor, to come and talk about that specialty, and I think it would be of interest to uh, all the cockers like us. So that's that meeting. We have Rabbi Ben David coming in, a, in the next couple months, not Jerry David, Ben David who will talk about uh, a book he wrote recently. And uh, in March, two of our members here will be giving a very informative meeting about very interesting topics. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mel Chilowich. OK, everybody hear me? Good. Uh, a little while ago, I asked uh, Dave how much time I had to, uh, you know, to make my presentation. He said, look, you're here to talk. We're here to listen. If we finish first, we'll let you know. <laughs> right. uh, of course, the, the clock's going to uh, put some uh, constraint on our, uh, on our time. Uh, I'm going to just tell you very briefly about my background so we put this discussion a little bit into context. I, I, I was born and raised in Bar Mitzvah in Mount Vernon, New York. Uh, I went to high school and a boarding school in England while we lived in Europe. Uh, I went to college in Iowa, law school in Washington, uh, practiced law for 10 years uh, in New Jersey and New York. I uh, spent 21 years with a family business, which we're going to talk about. And for the last 20 years, I've been a financial advisor, uh, helping people with retirement and stay re staying retired. That, that's, my, that's my background in a nutshell. Uh, the whole concept of Russia, the whole concept of Russia, um, sort of made, had a tremendous impact on my life. It sort of shaped my life. That may sound a little bit strange, but let me, let me explain why. Uh, first of all, I made 75 trips to Russia uh, over time. I'm, you know, oh, I didn't make as many to China. I only went to China 52 times. Uh, but uh, the, the way, the way uh, uh, so, so with 75 you know, trips like that over a period of time, I have to sort of pick and choose really what I want to talk to you about. So uh, I'm going to, I'm, I've divided it into three, uh, into three parts. The first part is what I call uh, the twilight zone part. It's because when you go to Russia in the early days, it felt like you were going into the twilight zone and then you came out and you said, what the, was that all about? 
then the second part I call my hurricane uh, 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 experience. And the third one, we'll just talk a little bit maybe about what's going on today over there and some of the political and, uh, and, and Jewish things that, uh, that I had some experience with. Anyhow, my father uh, uh, and the family grew up in, uh, in, in, in Poland and Russia and uh, were already doing business, some business with Russia back in the 1920s and right up into the war. Uh, and then they came over here and uh, started their business over here. The main business was raw hides. I mean, it sounds kind of lousy, but it's, uh, it's a big business. And hides are created every single day. Uh, and uh, I used to follow, you know, I, 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 I was very interested in all the places he was going to, which is primarily Europe, South America. And uh, I always said, when can we go? When can we go? So finally, uh, he promised us a vacation in Europe in the summer of 1956. We left two weeks after my bar mitzvah and all those nice presents and everything were put in a closet and I couldn't wait to get back to them, you know, like a new football helmet, uh, shoulder pads, etc. So we went to Europe, it was a great time, traveled around, saw everything. I'm, I'm 13 years old at that point. Uh, I could write a book on that, uh, that summer alone. Uh, and right when we were sort of getting ready to come to go back, my parents sat us down, or this is probably September 1st, and said, by the way, we're not going back. Oh, no. You're going to be going to boarding school in England. Uh, we're living in, our, our home right at that point is in Rotterdam, Holland. My brother and I are going to boarding school in England. Now, when I was a kid, misbehaving, my parents always said, I'm going to send you to boarding school if you don't behave. I guess this is some kind of payback. Uh, so there we are. Now, now I'm, uh, it's 1956, and we're in boarding school. But the reason we did that is because my father had had an opportunity to go back to Russia as one of the first American business people to get a visa uh, to be able to go back to Russia. And he saw so much opportunity there that he said, let's stay and see what we can do. And, and for me, the rest is sort of, sort of history. But what he was able to accomplish, and, and this is sort of an indication of what it's like to do business in Russia, what he was able to accomplish, he got a contract for a million dollars worth of raw hides, which today is probably about $20 million. Well, that's a nice, nice size business. Uh, uh, so the, the first thing he had to do, and this is back in 1950, was to try to find a bank that would you know, loan us a million dollars to be able to buy the raw material and so forth. Very, very hard. There was not one American bank. Deutsche Bank. No, there wasn't. We, we, I don't know whether Deutsche Bank was that, that you know, busy in those days, but we, he finally got this loan through the Royal Bank of Canada. Guy believed in him. And so anyhow, so that, that first business was done. And thereafter, it just became bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and uh, eventually we were selling them uh, uh, things like uh, boatloads of chicken parts. You know, we, we, don't, we like the white meat here, right? They like the dark meat over there. So we were shipping boatloads of, of uh, chicken, chicken, th uh, chicken uh, drumsticks. In fact, they used to call them Noshki Busha. That means Bush's, uh, Bush's Lakes, because it was during uh, President Bush's time that we were doing that. But we, we, we got, we got you know, the, the elder Bush. But we were, uh, uh, you know, the, the point is we were selling very large quantities of, of things. And uh, you know, you've heard of Arm and Hammer, people like that. That was a—he was a—he a, 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 was the head of a public organization. So people knew about what he was doing and so forth. And shareholders it had you know, made, very made, made public. We were a very large private company, and but we, because we were private, we could do certain things sort of you know uh, below the uh, surface. Uh, one of the things that the Soviet Union was always uh, concerned about was that with the word, you, you probably remember, uh, so many bushels of wheat were, were sold to the Soviet Union and so forth. Uh, because these business, first of all, these businesses were huge because you had a central buying organization. Uh, each, each industry sort of had its own, uh, uh, what we call foreign trading organization. So that was the agricultural department. Well, if they wanted to buy sugar, let's say, and, and the word got out that the Soviets were going to be buying sugar, the market, the market price would go way up. Okay? So they would come to us. We could buy sugar quietly, all right, and we would ship it to them from different places. And it was like that with a number of different products. So you may have seen things going, you may have seen the news about uh, uh, bushels of wheat and so forth or whatever, but that was probably only half of what they were buying because they were buying a lot more uh, from people like us. Anyhow, so getting a visa in those days was uh, was not easy. My father was probably one of the first American businessmen to go over there. Pepsi had been there, you know. Pepsi was uh, 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 selling Pepsi in exchange for taking, you know, taking vodka back. 
Uh, but I thought what I'd do is give you a uh, give you just an ex a, a typical taste of what it was like to go to Russia and do business. I mean, I'm not going to talk about the business itself, but I want you to sort of get a sense of the, 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 the experience. So you'd get on a plane, which is always a Western plane. We never took we never took Aeroflot uh, anywhere if we could avoid it. Yeah. Not that it would have been that bad, but I mean, you know, they always told us, you know, you had an 87% chance of making it safely. So, uh, you know. Uh, but uh, so we would get on, let's say, Lufthansa, fly into Moscow. You only have Westerners on the plane. Uh, and uh, we'd be picked up with somebody from our organization over there. We had an office there at that point. Would pick us up, take us to the hotel. Now, you get a. You get a in those days, and I'm talking about the early 70s, you would, get a, 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 you would get assigned to a particular hotel. Well, there were two types of hotels. There was sort of the, 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 the exclusive uh, uh, place that like Lenin used to stay. That's the National Hotel. We had our office in that hotel. And then you had the rest of the Soviet hotels. Right? Now think, imagine this, a room with yellow furniture and a, and a building stuck to it. I mean, that's basically what the hotel rooms were like there. I mean, it's, it's just anywhere you went in the entire Soviet Union, the hotel looked the same and, and constructed the same. So we always were able to stay at the National Hotel because our office was there. Uh, and that's like, imagine going into a beautiful antique shop. And that's what it was like. It was just old, everything was old antiques. Uh, and there's no lobby. You'd come in, there'd be two guys there to help you with the luggage, and one would be looking at it, sort of like, I don't know, what do I do now? And the other guy would be lifting it a little bit. Uh, you pretty much had to do everything yourself. There were no credit cards in those days. You had to come and pay with, uh, uh, pay with traveler's checks. Remember those? I still dream about them. Where are my traveler checks? Uh, and uh, you'd get assigned to your room. Now, on every floor in those days, there was something called a key lady. Anybody, by the way, anybody been to the Soviet Union in those days? Okay. Do you remember there were key ladies? Did you, were you there before the fall of the Soviet Union? No, there were key ladies. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. So I don't know. I, I, I thought they sort of disappeared uh, afterwards. But anyhow, so they would keep an eye on you. They'd give you your key and, uh, you know, try to bring somebody to your room. I mean, forget about it. Uh, uh, and uh, so then you'd be assigned to your room. Now, the first, I remember the, one of the first experiences I had was I wanted to get my suit cleaned. I had gotten dirty or wrinkled. So I gave him my suit and uh, in some sort of uh, foreign language uh, that we were able to, to uh, uh, understand between us. They sent the suit out. Anyhow, the next day the suit comes back. It was washed, beautifully washed. Uh, the buttons were in the pocket. They had taken the buttons off. And that was, the, that was the way my suit was clean. I never did that again, ever. Uh, right. right. Anyhow, so then we go down to dinner. No, I'm sorry. The first thing we do, and we, we go across the street. There was a, the post office. And the most important thing was to send a telex. I don't know if you remember what a telex was. That was pre-fax. And we would send a telex to our office with the room number of each of us that were over there. You know, we used to, we used to go you know, in teams, basically, so that they could then tell our wives what our phone number was. Everybody had their own individual phone number. Right? If you wanted a place to call home, you had to book it usually about two days in advance. And then you had to be there at that phone, at your phone, when that call came through. So if you were at a meeting or something, you know, uh, you know you just didn't make it, so uh, so it just helped you a little bit. It made you feel a little bit like a prisoner, in, in a sense. Um, so anyhow, so so you would do that. Then we might go down to the bar, uh, or the the uh, dining room. Now, imagine this. Imagine a a uh, a menu the size of a typical uh, uh, diner menu here. You know, the diner's got everything on it. Well, you had everything on this menu. So you look down and you say, Oh, gee, I think I'd like. Uh, can I have this uh, veal cooked this way? No, no, not, not available. Well, how about this? No, not available. What's available? Same three things every time. Chicken Kievsky, which is chicken Kiev, beef steak, and a little piece of sturgeon with a couple of boiled potatoes. Forget about dessert and so forth. That was it. You know, but they had this big fancy because it was, it was their main hotel in Moscow, and they had to impress people. All right. All right, so anyhow, the next day, uh, you, you'd arrange cards. You, you didn't have taxis uh, for people like us. You had to have, everything had to be by private car because they wanted to keep an eye on you, all right? It was a, a, a way of uh, surveillance. So the car would take us to our appointment, all right? We'd always have preset appointments with one of these uh, trading organizations. And uh, we'd be taken there, and when you arrived, you had to be right on time. You had to be on time because they'd send someone downstairs to be waiting for you. They bring you upstairs to a conference room and you do your business and, and, and so forth. Uh, and, uh, but he, here's the thing. 
not everybody could do business in the Soviet Union because, think about this a minute, there was this one office on this one street that did business for the entire Soviet Union. All right? So if they bought something, all right, they bought it in, 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 in the volumes of, of, of millions. All right? I'll give you an example. Uh, sort of later, in, later in, uh, in the 80s when Gorbachev came in, he, wanted, he promised people all kinds of uh, uh, you know, uh, personal luxuries and so forth. They didn't have, the women didn't have so, uh, soaps, they didn't have pantyhose, they didn't have uh, uh, dress footwear and so forth. So just as an example, one of the things they asked us to do finally was uh, get, us, uh, uh, get us a line of, fa of you know, fancy dress footwear for women. All right. Now, up to that point, they would never buy a pair of shoes or import a pair of shoes that wasn't leather. They didn't consider it uh, good. Now they said you can have non-leather products. So I got together with Sears, and I looked at their line, and they helped me pick out a line of shoes which we brought over there. And they picked out, I think, I don't know, eight or ten different styles. And you're talking about 50 million pairs of shoes. All right. Uh, 50 million pairs of, because they were distributed every place. Now, not too many people, not too many companies can do that kind of business. That's why, you know, that's why we were, uh, you know, fairly successful because we, 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 you know, we grew with this, so we knew how to do it. Uh, and there, in fact, we were actually even representing other companies in the agricultural field. That was our main business: rawhides and agricultural uh, uh, equipment, which we. Uh, uh, which we were bringing over there uh, as, as they needed it. So we had developed a pretty close relationship with their Department of Agriculture. We had been brought in uh, 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 things to help their crops, uh, uh, irrigation equipment, and we, we built feed yards. We showed them how to build feed yards and a number, number of things like that. Uh, let's see, what else in terms of, uh, oh, now, one of the other things I wanted to mention, every hotel in those days, anyhow, and I only stayed in, in a couple because uh, I, I, you know, this it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't so much in the uh, uh, in the, in the small smaller towns, but let's say in our hotel, in the National Hotel, which I remember very well, they had a bar where you could order right off the menu again, you know, vodka, uh, and uh, that was about it. But anyhow, you'd be sitting there having a meeting and so forth, and there'd be a lot of girls around, very pretty girls. And if there was music or a little dancing, they would come over and ask you to dance. Well, most, most of these girls were prostitutes, all right? And we knew to stay away from them. But think about, Why? Uh, think about, <laughs> but think about, think about, they were there to get information, all right? You were never gonna be able to bring them to your room because of the key lady, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and all of the, uh, uh, the other things that went on with that. But think about this for a minute. Our president, who was accused of having, you know, been involved with prostitutes in Russia, I believe that you put girls like this in front of him, which is going to take place. I believe that there's no question about it. You know, he went for the bait. <laughs> All right. So, no question in my mind that that's not fake news. Yeah. Now, how did you get paid? In what rubles? In no, we'd get dollars? paid. No, that's a good question. We we would always get paid in dollars. Uh, but eventually, eventually, we had very large we had very large credit lines of like two, three hundred million dollars to do those kind of businesses. And there came a point where the American banks wanted in, all right, because a Soviet contract was like, like gold. I mean, the, the Soviets never, ever defaulted on a contract, all right? So that was like, that was like money in the bank. Uh, but you couldn't, you know, it, you couldn't be a, a little small operator and do business there because the demands were, the demands were too big. Here, here's an, another story I'll tell you. Uh, we were, as I said, we were very involved with uh, the Department of Agriculture. And you know they had these five-year plans, and which always failed. But uh, we uh, we went to the Kremlin one day to have a meeting. We had been putting together a an enormous agricultural project to present to them. Uh, and by the way, this it was about a billion-dollar contract, and to to really overhaul the Soviet agricultural system. Uh, and we were supposed to meet with Gorbachev. My father was supposed to meet Gorbachev when he came to New York. I think it was 1988. He was supposed to be there. Uh, he, he came in uh, and uh, uh, he was supposed to sign the contract with my father the following morning. So we're, we're working in the office late to getting things ready. And I hear on the radio there's an earthquake in Armenia. I don't know if you remember that. Well, the next day he was gone. The contract was never signed. That business was, that business was never done. But. Uh, bef before that point, we had gone. We had been invited in one of the meetings to the chairman of the Soviet Agricultural uh, uh, Department. This wasn't a trading organization. This was the head guy. This was like the secretary of, 
of agriculture. So we, I think four or five of us, with a translator, we go into the invited into the Kremlin to this guy's office. I mean, it's quite quite an impressive place, and we go into his office. And I'm telling you, not, I, I'm 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 telling you this for a particular point, which I'm going to come back to later. This guy, typical burly type of Russian guy, sitting at the end of a table that's literally 100 feet long, all right, with Soviets around it, and they had their discussions and so forth. And he had to make a long story short. Now, this is the number one guy of our guards. You know, this is he's right up there. After the fall of the Soviet Union, which I'll, I'll get to in a couple of minutes, this guy is knocking on our door as a private citizen looking for a job. Mm -hmm. uh, amazing, looking for a job. I'll never forget that. I was there at that particular moment. I actually let him come in and, intro and brought, him, brought him into the office. That to me is so, so ludicrous. This big shot at this, the end of this big table comes to us for a job. Anyway, I'm going to get back to uh, 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 some of that type of thing uh, afterwards. Uh, just a little bit about traveling in the Soviet Union. I told you that the only way you could travel there was on a Soviet plane, and uh, that was always a little bit of a, a scary thing. But you couldn't just go any place you wanted to. You couldn't just book a plane ride and say, I'm going to Kiev or somewhere like that. You had to get a visa, uh, and uh, sometimes that was very hard. I took my wife to Russia once. I think it was 1987, 88. I took her there to show her uh, you know, the Soviet Union. I was able to get her a visa to come in. But when we were there, they asked me to go to Kiev or, or I don't know, uh, uh, some other town, maybe Odessa, to inspect some, some merchandise. I said, okay. I applied for the visa. My wife applied for the visa. I got mine. She didn't get hers. I wasn't going to leave her in Moscow by herself. So I, you know, I put that trip over. But it wasn't easy. Doing business there was not, it was a big business, but you were never totally comfortable. The KGB, you know, was always around. You know, it's not like a guy in a trench coat was standing behind you. But wherever you went, there was a KGB guy. If you went to a, a, a meeting and there was a table of, uh, of Russians sitting there, you knew one or two was with the KGB. And he was probably the guy that spoke the best English, and he was the guy that was always talking to you about your life and your family and so forth, because he was trying to get information. But I can tell you also that in our hotel, the National Hotel, I once passed by a room where the door was open and I could see all this electronic equipment inside and televisions and things, people looking. You know, it, it, was, it was really like, just like what you, what you read about it in a, uh, uh, in a book. Uh, we never talked business in our office because we always assumed people were, were listening. We talked maybe in the hallway, maybe we talked outside. We never talked in our in taxis or, or the private cars that took us different places. Uh, it was that type of an atmos that atmosphere. Uh, I just, as I said, I'm trying to give you a little taste. I can I can tell you this. I, I said it was like going into the twilight zone. When we when when we left again, maybe on Lufthansa, you get on the plane. Now there were no Russians because the Russians, even if they had visas to leave for for some special reason, they would always fly on on Aeroflot. Uh, but as we flew over Poland and East. Germany and just crossed into West Germany, the pilot would announce we're now out of Soviet airspace and everybody would clap and be excited in the plane. It was, uh, it was, it was real. There were, there were memorable experiences uh, in that period. Not as interesting as afterwards, but there was certainly, uh, you know, there, there were uh, times when uh, I, I, was, I was frightened, uh, that I was nervous, uh, even though we were well respected there as, uh, as a favorite uh, trading partner. Uh, it was, uh, it was not, not, not the kind of experience I recommend for people. So if you say to me, uh, yeah. Out of curiosity, when you were selling these large quantities of yeah. things from the United States to the Soviet Union, didn't you have to get permission? Yes, oh, so you had to get export licenses. But a lot of the stuff was not from the United States. Sometimes we would acquire from somewhere else. Like vegetable oils we might get from uh, Singapore, let's say, that type of thing. But, and there was, there was some, sometimes we'd send equipment in ship equipment of various things, we'd have to get export licenses from the government. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes the FBI would come to interview us after we've been there, what do we notice, what, what are we here, what, what kind of business were you doing? Uh, but uh, yes? Was there an American by the name of Cyrus who apparently had, had a working relationship with the Russians? Is there yeah, going way back. Yeah. Did he work with you? No. 
No, I think he eventually was uh, Secretary of Commerce or something, wasn't he? Or Secretary of Agriculture. He was a pretty well-known guy. Now, I, I, my father's, our competitor was primarily uh, like uh, some of the big companies, uh, Card Card Cardill, Car Car Cargill, uh, and uh, you know Arm and Hammer and, and those those types of people, Pepsi Cola. But you had to be a you had to be a fairly big company in order to do that kind of business. Yeah. How long you needed the visa to go to Kiev? Because at that time, it was the USSR. And Kiev was part of USSR. Because, because you didn't you didn't ask for that when you applied for your original visa. I, mean, I didn't know where I was going to be going. I applied for a visa to Moscow. Right. You were you you couldn't you couldn't go just any place that you wanted to. So if you want to go say Pete, Pete you had to get had to get a visa. Yeah. Yeah. It well, was their it was their way of keeping control of you. All right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I know that from working with some of the contracts that I, there are give backs where you are involved with. Um, the Russians will buy a certain amount of uh, aircraft from us, but they'll expect a certain amount of business in return. You're talking about like counter trade, that type of thing? Offices. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, of course you, you had some of that, you of course. Involved. Because remember, in those days, hard currency was hard for them to come by. Yes. So, for instance, Pepsi Cola was a counter trade situation, right? They would, you call it offsets, I call it counter trade. They would send in Pepsi Cola. And you would have to take back a certain amount of, uh, right? I mean, they would put bottling plant. This, they didn't ship bottles in. They they bottle it there. Ch in China, it's Coca Cola. Right? In Russia, it's Pepsi. That's why one of the reasons I like Russia. I like Pepsi better. Uh, anyhow, let, let me just go on for a minute because I want to get to the hurricane stage. Okay. So that's sort of the way life was up to uh, August 19th, 1991, the day we, we're actually having a hurricane. Now at that point. Our office in White Plains, New York. We'd been down on Wall Street for 50 years, but we just moved up to White Plains. And I remember driving up there Monday morning, August 19th, 1991, and I hear on the radio the fall of the Soviet Union. I mean, Gorbachev had surrendered. Or I don't remember exactly the detail, but you knew it was over. I said, uh-oh, I can only imagine the atmosphere that's going to be in the office when I get there. Because we, we were very favorite partners. It was, I don't want to say business was easy, but it was simple because you had one buyer. You know, and and for instance, with Rawhides, there were three or four large international companies, and we were friendly competitors. We all sort of shared the business. We ended up getting generally a little bit of the better better part because we've been doing it longer. Uh, but at that point, at that point, we knew that there was going to be a problem. Well, let me ask you something. Think of this for a minute. Your bank is at, let's say, in Wells Fargo. All right, that's where you have your cash. I don't know. Let's say you got hundred thousand dollars in savings there, and you arrive to take the money out and say, "Oh, we don't exist anymore. We were taken over by the such and such bank over there, and they closed us all down." Well, who do you go to for who do you go to for your money? Where's, where's the money? Who's, who's going to give you your money? It was the same type of thing. This happened. Remember, I said a, a Soviet contract was like money in the bank until they default. All right. Theoretically. You should be putting a little money away every single business to offset any future default. But you know who thought about it? I mean, who thought Soviet Union was going to default? So suddenly we, we're owed about two hundred million dollars, uh, and uh, who's who's going to pay the bill? This was the big this was the big uh, the big problem. Well, some of the smaller trading firms uh, that we dealt with uh, they had different accounts here and there and so we were able to get most of the money but they still owed us about 45 million dollars now when you're a private company you know that's a lot of money all right yeah we had there were four partners uh, that uh, were basically invested in this and that that was big and, and that ultimately honestly brought, brought the company down to its knees uh, little by little we sold off divisions and so forth but what was it like when that happened what was trading and what was doing business in Russia like after the fall of the Soviet Union it was chaos right? I call it the popcorn years because uh, everybody at that point wanted in because it was going to be for private enterprise every company now you know everybody was it, it was like the Wild West everybody running around to do business there, the Russians trying to do, to, to do business outside. It really was chaos, almost the Wild West. It was dangerous. Uh, nobody wanted to accept rubles. Uh, you had to bring $100 bills in with you uh, in order to do things. Um, I was buying raw material uh, in, the, in the South uh, at a joint venture I, I was putting together. Uh, suppliers would not accept rubles anymore. They'd only accept dollars. I would come in with, with two and three and four and five thousand dollars in $100 notes. $100 bills, and uh, you know people were getting bumped off over there uh, for that type of thing. But the dollar was king. Right? Rubles, 
you had to use rubles in some places. So I would, let's say, cash a check for, for a traveler check for $20. And uh, I would get back rubles like this. I'd have to fit in my pockets. They wouldn't even—they wouldn't even fit, to tell you the truth. I mean, I still have a few at home if you need any. Uh, but that—that uh, it, that be, it became very difficult. But uh, now you're talking about private enterprise. Let's talk a little bit about you know. I'm trying to rush through. Let's talk about how do you, how do you, how do these people become oligarchs? You know, these people, these these huge uh, uh, business people in the oil business and this and that. Business. How do they become oligarchs? As I understand it. What happened was, once the Soviet Union wasn't there anymore, now you had all these businesses and, and organizations that had no owner. So what happened was, uh, each, each, uh, uh, each organization, they gave shares of the business to their employees. It, it wasn't worth anything to them, right? So what happened is a few people that had some money would start buying up all those shares for dollars. They were able to get some dollars and they started buying up one after the other after the other until they had total control over the industry. And that's how these people, I mean, how, how, how long does it take? It takes generations to do that in the West. Yeah, they did in just you know, a matter of a year or two and you know, all of a sudden you had these big oligarchs. Uh, I, I, had a, I was introduced to a guy in southern Russia and I'm going to talk a little bit about some, some of my uh, Jewish experiences. Uh, I, had a, I, w I was able to develop a partner in southern Russia who was Jewish. He was the first Jewish, he was the first Russian ruble billionaire. He was a billionaire in rubles. Uh, but he had a, an agricultural complex in the south. We were doing some joint ventures together. And uh, this was a guy that was very cognizant of his Jewishness and understood all about the Refusenik period. You remember that, that period? And what he was doing every Tuesday, every Tuesday, now this is right after 1991, every Tuesday he had hired a, a, uh, an airflow plane that looked like a 737, our old 727, and was, was flying out the peasantry, the Jewish peasantry from the entire southern area of Russia. Okay. He was flying, every Tuesday he'd fly them into Israel, right, and the plane would come back uh, pretty much empty. All right. uh, not too many people want to come back. Uh, and uh, this was one of the ways that the Soviet Jews were getting out of Israel through this uh, the, through this uh, outlet. Did the government was they okay with that? Yeah. Well, the, the government there was no there, there was no there was no it, yeah people started to travel. There was no you didn't need an exit visa anymore. And no passports. Well, you had to have it. everybody had a passport. Everybody has a passport, passport in Russia. It, yeah, you go. You get on the plane and you go. Yeah. Well, let's talk. Let's go back a little bit. If you recall, and I recall very well, uh, I started going over there in the period of Brezhnev. Remember that name? Okay. He came to Glassboro. All right. Uh, it put such a taint on it they changed the name to Rowan. But um, anyhow, so uh, that was the typical type of Soviet leader: Khrushchev, Brezhnev, that type of guy. And then two or three that died after that. And then this guy Gorbachev comes along. Gorbachev is a much more educated, enlightened. Uh, uh, individual, and uh, when he came in, he came in with two philosophies. One was called perestroika, uh, or and the other was glasnost, openness and truth. Right? He wanted to have much more transparency. He wanted to do more for the people. He wanted the he wanted the people to enjoy life much more uh, like Westerners did, and that's where we got involved, bringing shoes and you know stockings and the kind of things that they needed, uh, chicken parts. Uh, but what happened was he started to he started to uh, free up things. He started to make it easier, a little bit easier to get exit visas to travel. Uh, at that point, Jews were able to get visas easier, uh, and uh, he was trying to westernize it a little bit, uh, a lot, a lot more. Uh, it was more interesting. I mean, he had meetings with with Reagan. You know, there's a very good book that my my cousin actually uh, wrote uh, because he was one of the he was the head. His name was uh, Ed Edelman. Uh, and uh, he was one of the people that were with Reagan. He was his economic, economic, uh, what do you call it? Huh? I, well, no, he was uh, the, the chairman of the, uh, of, of the, of the, uh, uh, our, our atomic uh, energy program. Anyhow, so he wrote a pro he wrote a book actually on what took place there. Uh, he was in a lot of the meetings. And uh, I have that book, by the way. If anybody wants to borrow it, I'll be happy to I'll loan it to you. Uh, but, uh, you could see through their discussions already that Gorbachev was willing to give a little bit, you know. 
And, and I can only say, and, and you know, th it wasn't just what was going on in Russia. It's the freedoms that were starting to be given to, it's probably started Poland, if you remember, with Wes, uh, what's it, Lech 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 terrible with names. Uh, and they started to get some freedoms in other places. And uh, uh, then Yeltsin, then you had Yeltsin that came in as the, as the president of the Russian Republic. And uh, it just got to the point where people started to have so many freedoms, they just, it became very hard to reverse things. And it got to the point where he was, there was a time when he was actually uh, kidnapped, if you remember. I think that happened on August 19th also. Uh, he was actually kidnapped and taken to a, a place, I think maybe in, in Georgia or somewhere like that, uh, down, in the, uh, down in the Crimea, right. And uh, he, uh, at that point, you know, he had to negotiate all kinds of things, came back and resigned uh, as the chairman of the Soviet Union. That was basically the end of it. But I wanted to say something. You hear a lot about Reagan, you know, beat the Soviets, and Reagan, you know, uh, you know, beat communism. So that's really not true. Yeah, he was the guy on the scene. But I want to tell you, if they didn't have a Soviet leader that was willing to be flexible and to start opening up and so it never would have happened, right? People don't give, Westerners don't give him enough credit, uh, uh, Gorbachev, for uh, bringing communism down. And uh, anyhow, by the way, one of the experiences I had after the fall of the Soviet Union, I don't know if you remember, but a certain group of people, and I don't remember who it was, whether they were communists still trying to hold on, they took over parliament, which was a big, tall building, and they didn't, they didn't sort of come out with their hands up. Yeltsin actually had to send artillery shells into the building. Uh, it was almost the beginning of a revolution. I was there, yeah. all right? And, and we were given notice, you might have to get out real fast. Uh, it was a very scary, <laughs> a very scary time. That whole period afterwards was kind of scary, as I told you. People had, people were being kidnapped. People had had bodyguards and so forth. But, but just briefly, just doing business became much more difficult because you're dealing with people who were trying to do business for the first time. They had no business culture. They had no experience with it. Nobody wanted to lose money. Right, if there was, if there was going to be a loss in the relationship, it was going to be you as far as they're concerned. So you always had to make sure that there were, that you had some uh, stop gaps in there, some, some protections, because they had no credit. You'd have to be able to give, you'd have to be, give, be able to give people credit, uh, because there were no banks. The banks didn't operate, they didn't, they didn't have dollars. But if, so if you wanted something from them, or they wanted something from you, you had to sort of make your own arrangements. It was very, very difficult. Uh, and uh, uh, I found, as I say, I, I, the, so a, a contract in those days was just a piece of paper. You had to make sure the person behind it, you know, had had some sort of some sort of credibility because uh, it was tough. And I came across many situations where I come in with dollars and give a guy the, 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 some money, and I was supposed to get raw material, and oh, it's late, and so forth. I mean, it was a, it was the corruption was incredible. Yeah. With all these experiences and everything else, I shied away from it. Russia. Well, I was shy. Yeah. You know, well, let's, see, let's say we made a lot of money over the years. I mean, the, 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 the profits were enormous because we weren't just working for ourselves. We were representing many of your largest corporations in America. We were called the five percenters. We'd make five percent on the sale. In fact, there was a there was a uh, there was an article in the Forbes magazine about us uh, in the late '80s. A picture of my father on the paper and. Uh, so we made money not just uh, ourselves, but also on, on the backs of other but people. My fear was that you had no control of it. Well, back in those days, you did when it was the Soviet Union, all right? And the Soviet but Union then it fell apart. Then it fell apart. Then people weren't doing business like they were. It was very, very hard. It was very hard. You know. uh, the thing you hear is that when everything fell apart and became very chaotic, a lot of the Russian mobs you know, we're not really the ones that grow, the ones that all came over to Brighton Beach. They were the ones who took a lot of the businesses over because they already had a structure in place. Right. They had the business acting in. Right. That pretty much happened that way? A lot of it, yeah. A lot of it, sure. Uh, listen, uh, I, uh, I wouldn't, to, even today, and I haven't done business in a long time, but I know people who have tried and so forth. I don't know too many Americans, and you don't read about too many Americans going over there to do business today. You know, it's not just getting paid, but what about the legal system? How, how, how protected are you in a country that has no, still to this day, doesn't have a legal system that can really protect you? Uh, or or the, the, the freedoms that we have, the freedom of the press and so forth. I wouldn't trust, I wouldn't trust a Russian any further I could throw him. I mean, I'm sorry to say that. But even though some of them are Jewish, that doesn't necessarily mean it, because most of the mob over in Brighton Beach are Jewish, and uh, you know, <laughs> it's uh, yeah. Uh, well, two, two questions. One, uh, as a Jewish company, 
how are you treated under the uh, under the USSR, and then how are you yeah. treated under? The That's a good question because I wanted to I wanted to raise that. What was it like to be Jewish there? First of all, I would say the second in command in most of these organizations we dealt with were Jewish. There were many Jewish people in leadership business, never at the, right at the top, but they were there. They let you know who they were. You always had a little bit of a, 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 a friendlier, a little bit more of a friendly basis with these people. Uh, but we were never, I mean, we never experienced anything anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish or something like that. that was, I, I mean, i got to be honest, you heard about it, but I never saw it. But the way you, you understood it was people like ourselves would never get to be the head of the organization. All right, so, so we were always frowned upon that way. But there was so much mixed marriage there. All right, you come across, oh, my husband's Jewish, my wife's Jewish. I mean, it was, remember, a lot of Jewish people there in, uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, I want to just say one thing. During a lot of the period that I was there in the 70s and 80s, you had this whole thing going on with the refuseniks. Remember the Sakharovs and the Sharanskys and so forth? And you had an awful lot of that, people getting arrested and a lot, a lot of stuff. And uh, you had the, 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 the bringing down of the Korean airliner and you had the, and, 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 uh, the uh, uh, you know, uh, Afghanistan invasion and, and all, all kinds of things. And, and Reagan actually, remember, called them the evil empire? I remember going to my father one day and said, look, I don't understand something. We're Jewish. Well, these people are horrible. Why are we doing business with them? I don't know. What is it? I'm, I'm talking to a guy that's making millions off of this. He said, you know, he said, if we're not talking and not doing business, what are we doing? We just, then we've got a real good reason to fight. This is a way having a business, having dialogue, as, as, un, as unseemly as it may seem from time to time, was a way, we thought, of, of creating peace. All right. We couldn't do much as Jews because we didn't want to be thrown out, obviously. So we couldn't be bringing, we weren't bringing prayer books over, that type of thing. But we go to the big synagogue. You know, the, 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 there's a huge synagogue in Moscow, which is beautiful. Uh, we got to know a few of the people there. We couldn't give them dollars, but we could give them some rubles as a donation to the synagogue, you know, that kind of thing. We could bring them, we could, we could buy a few things for them there that they couldn't buy themselves. One of the things we did do, and uh, we don't talk much about it, my grandfather was very involved in uh, UJA and, and, and uh, Jewish activities. He and uh, Isaac Stern, you've heard of him, and my father, quietly brought in, were able to get out and brought into this country a number of Jewish artists and musicians. Right? We did it sort of in a quiet way. It wasn't the kind of thing you see in the press. Uh, today, some of those people are quite, you know, are quite well known here uh, in terms of their, their fields. Uh, but we didn't get involved in that type of thing, and uh, there was one experience where I got a phone call from a guy in Russia asking me to help him with a visa to come to America because he, he had an American uh, fiance here. It was a, that's a story by itself. Uh, but let me, uh, so let me say this. In terms of today, in terms of this guy Putin, and so I don't know what's going to be, but I think for what I've read and seen, the Russian people seem to want an authority, an authority, authoritarian type of leader. Right? Uh, you had that all through history. Right? And uh, even Gorbachev, who, who was, you know, relented a little bit, still, you know, was still the, uh, the, the, the big father type of figure. That's what Putin is today. I don't know where it's going to go. Uh, I can tell you this, that the Russian people that I knew were very appreciative of doing business with Americans. Uh, they, uh, uh, they were being paid American dollars at that point, after the fall, to, to work for American companies. They live like us, they dress like us, uh, they, uh, they eat like us, but there's still something there in the genes, whatever it is, there's, there's a certain toughness in their leadership. It's almost like the children are looking to make sure the big daddy is still there in case they need him, you know, to sort of to lean on. It's a strange, it's a strange sort of society. The same way that China's a big society. I mean, they got a 1.3 billion uh, people and they're thriving. Well, I don't know. Is a communist socialist system maybe good for a crowd like that? I don't know. I'm, uh, that's not for me to judge. But I can only say this: the the uh, uh, the experience of doing business in a place like that was not a was not a pleasant one. Right? When, when you're when you're living in sort of fear of being watched, and uh, who knows uh, if they want to create an international incident, they they take you off the street as American uh, businessmen uh, accused of uh, you know. Uh, playing with uh, girls in the in the bar type of thing, uh, but uh, there were many other places that uh, that were more enjoyable. But I would say this: it was unique. We were some of the first Americans to to be going back and doing business in in the Soviet Union, and uh, I like to think we uh, we helped create some better relations. And uh, as I said, even Trump, who I really am not very fond of, said, "What's wrong with 
creating a better relationship with them. And I agree with that. All right? These people are much more like us than different from us. And I, I hope that there'll be you know, a lot more conversation uh, uh, between us in a friendly, friendly way. Anyway, that's pretty much it. I think I kept myself within the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that my check? That, that's your uh, check. I have a certificate of appreciation. Thank you. Excellent job. And thank you. Smile for the camera. Thank you. Okay, Investment Club. Investment Club following this meeting also will have a web a web committee meeting following this uh, the end of the meeting. 50 50? Okay, 734. Yeah, 8 6 9 Right here. Thank <laughs> you.